I've conducted hundreds of Microsoft 365 security assessments, and I've recommended Entra ID protection in nearly all of them. It's so powerful, but when it's finally used, it's often misunderstood or misconfigured. So in this video, you will learn five common mistakes in Entra ID protection and how to avoid them. We're here in the Entra Admin Center. We're going to start with mistake number one. For that, I'm going to head to protection. I'll jump into conditional access. And this first mistake is a common misunderstanding of how conditional access should be configured. I'll head to policies and I'm going to filter all my policies for risk. Now this will show the ones in my tenant I've got set up for risky events. I'll head into this one here, which is all about risky sign-ins. I'll head to conditions. And then I got my category here called sign-in risk. Now, on first appearance, it may seem that when we look at these checkboxes for high, medium, and low, that this means greater than or equal to. So for example, if I choose a low risk sign-in and I want to require some degree of security for that, you might assume, well, that's automatically going to apply to medium and high as well. These tick boxes, they mean equal to greater than or equal to. So for example, if I choose low, that's only going to apply to low risk sign-ins. And another related mistake is if I head to the user risk section, you'll see here I can configure this as well. So I've got my user risk and my sign-in risk. If in one policy, I configure two of these, both must be true at the point of sign-in for it to take effect. So really for optimal conditional access configuration, we want a separate policy for both user risk and for sign-in risk. Now next up, our second mistake that we're gonna address is to do with passwordless authentication. If I come out here and I'll say, go to my policy to do with high risk users, I'll go to conditions, user risk is high. And then if I go down, you'll see these grant options. You can optionally for high risk users, have a setting that says require password change. If you do that, it will mandatorily require MFA, which is great, but I want you to consider the implications of passwordless users here. A user can become high risk when you mark them as compromised. If I mark a passwordless user as compromised, this is gonna force them on their next sign-in to change their password. But if you've been a good passwordless admin, you followed the videos we've got on our channel to do with temporary access passwords and security keys, then the user's just gonna get a screen to change their password and they aren't gonna know what to do because they never had a password in the first place. So there's a few ways you can improve that situation for them. Number one, rather than using required password change, you could simply block the authentication. That's gonna make the error message a little bit clearer for your user. The other thing that you may wanna consider is, well, maybe for my users that have passwords, I'll require them to change their passwords. But then under this user section up here, under exclude, I will exclude a group of users who are my passwordless users. So I can have different rules for different folks there. And on that point, different rules for different folks, that takes us to our third mistake, which is more of an adoption issue than it is to do with actual real technical configuration. But don't consider identity protection to be something that you have to configure in a one size fits all manner. So for example, I'll add to my list of policies here and you'll see I get some targeting what I call global, all my users, and I've got some that just target my admin users. So for administrators and VIPs, I might want to take a little bit more of an aggressive approach. So for example, if I head to my admin policy here, you'll see for admins, if I go to my conditions, I go to user risk, I'm saying if you're an admin and you're medium or low, then I'm going to block you. However, for my other users, which is covered by my global policy, all my generic users who don't have particularly elevated levels of access, well, I'm going to only going to block you if you're a high risk. And this is very useful for adoption as well, because it means you can gradually roll out identity protection, right? You can start in a way that with your pilot users and build a bit of confidence that you're not going to be flooded by false positives and unintended consequences, and then gradually ramp up that protection over time. So point being, narrow the scope and don't consider this a one-size-fits-all solution. Fourth mistake, kind of related to that point about your policy shouldn't be one-size-fits-all, is don't automatically assume you should exclude guests from ID protection. The logic goes, I don't control my guest entry, and therefore I can't dismiss my guest's risks. And I don't want to lock my guests out and affect your productivity. Therefore, we can't enforce user-based risk policies on guests. I get it, but let's remind ourselves that in most guest access scenarios, you have far less oversight and control over the security of that user, their device, and therefore the session. It's possible, but rare, that customers check for the device compliance of a guest. Overwhelmingly, we just let them in with no attestation about device security. So my logic goes, if anything, we should be more aggressive 
with entry ID protection policies for our guests. This won't be something you can go gung-ho into, but it's something to consider. Last up, fifth mistake, and that's watch out for audit retention gotchas. The retention period for intra ID logs varies by your license level, but risky users never expire. This means at the free level, you'll only see seven days of risk sign-ins. Entra ID P1 bumps this up to 30 days. P2 goes up to 90 days. But unfortunately, this cannot backdate if you upgrade your licenses. So for example, if you have an incident and then you decide to buy P1 or P2 to get more data, that's not going to help. Where that can also sting you is if you've ever investigated Entra ID protection, then decide to pick it up. Entries in the risky users page, they're not going to be affected by retention periods, but the data you need to investigate them might be. So for example, the risk class updated field, it can be beyond your log retention, and you may not be able to follow up with a comprehensive investigation into other Entra ID logs like risky sign-ins or risk detections. So to avoid that problem, Keep on top of your risk investigations, export your data into other solutions like Log Analytics or Sentinel. Defender XDR's maximum retention period of 180 days, that might also help. Not with advanced hunting, however. So keep that in mind. If you want to learn even more mistakes in areas like conditional access, subscribe to the channel, see when we share more, and check out this video on common mistakes.